We are all born on this beautiful planet, and we're all born free. And yet, we cannot move around freely. We cannot live where we choose to. We have to follow rules and laws that we didn't agree to when we were born. We have to work to pay taxes and to earn this thing called money. We didn't agree to that either when we were born. We didn't agree to be given a number and be treated like a corporation. We are living, breathing human beings. We are not numbers of infinite soul and flesh and blood. And yet that's not how we are being treated. The restrictions on humanity are endless and they are getting worse by the day. The current situation is very simple. Every social political system has failed us. This is why we are in this mess. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about this stuff, right? If it was hunky-dory. Humans everywhere live in misery. There seems to be no happy outcome to the political and economic mess of the planet. Every year, every month, it gets worse. More poverty, more hunger, more homelessness, more misery. The global economic collapse is imminent. The fact that we still have a global economic system is actually miraculous. But it is a clear indication how powerful those individuals are that control the global economy. They have infinite power as it is now. Only us, only we can do something about it. And there's some simple things that we can do about it to change everything about our lives and how we continue living as living, breathing human beings and not numbers and corporations or fictitious fictional entities. One third of the world's food goes to waste. This is spectacular. What kind of creatures have we become that we deny one third of the global population food because they don't have money? We don't, give, we don't hand it out. We dump it. We destroy it because we can't give it to them for free. They need money. They need to work, lazy bastards. Do some work. Go get a job. Become a respectable member of society. Get a job. We don't need jobs. It's the last thing we need. Every time I hear politicians say, we're going to create jobs, I'd sense shivers down my spine. It's the last thing we need. Busyness. Keep you busy running around forgetting what you should be doing, what kind of life you should be living. It's all encoded in the language that we use. How did it get so bad? This is where we get back to what we've just been to, the ancient civilizations. A small group of royal political families and the banking elite families took control of the world. This didn't happen last year or 100 years ago. This happened thousands of years ago, people. It started with the Sumerians about 6,000 years ago in the Middle East and Sumeria. When the Sumerian tablets tell us, when kingdom was lowered to earth from heaven, that's why I pointed it out to you. They tell us, kingdom was lowered to earth. Suddenly, we see these priest kings appear out of nowhere. How did these guys suddenly took on this higher than now you know, situation? Who the hell are they? Where did they come from? Oh, people lived happily, and, and suddenly one guy said, hold on, I'm going to be your king. You're going to have to work for me and pay taxes. Screw you, buddy. I don't know. <laughs> so how did these priest kings in ancient times become so powerful? Because they were appointed by the gods. I'm not talking about God with a big G here. I'm talking about the gods with a small G, these arrogant pricks that came here and disturbed us on this beautiful planet. And what happened next after they appointed the priest kings? The most spectacular, miraculous thing happened. These priest kings created money. Money is not part of natural evolution. This is a complete misunderstanding of human history. Anyone that teaches you that has not done their homework. Money was maliciously introduced in ancient times as a tool of enslavement. The absolute tool of enslavement. And we are feeling the worst brunt of it right now. We are the guys, we are the civilization, we are the, the people on, in the history of this planet right now that can make a change. It's up to us what we do with this information and how we move from here forward. Today there are three main banking families, there are arguably a few more, but the big ones, obviously the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, they control everything. They own all the banks in the world. How can I make the statement? Because they're the guys that bail out the banks when they go under. So they own them. It's simple, right? If you bail somebody out, you're going to own them. And you're not going to bail something out that you don't own, or at least that you don't control. So the World Bank, the IMF, the BI, the Bank of International Settlement in Basel, Switzerland, most people aren't even aware that there's a thing called the Bank of International Settlement. When they discover this, they, what? Wow, that's amazing. I hope they're good people. <laughs> Can't they give us a loan? <laughs> Remember, people, money doesn't exist. Okay, I'm going to get into this. Uh, yes, did you want to say? 
now say all the past history was rubbish and it was all evil, but still it was a government, the president. I don't understand it. So okay. You believe in the system, but everything else was rubbish. No, 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 no. I don't, no, no. Well, no, 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 you, you're getting the wrong end of the stick. We, we, we created the, yes, you are. We created the Ubuntu Liberation Movement. I'm going through it now. Just hold, hold on, you'll understand where I'm going with this. Okay. There, there's going to be a lot of point in time to ask questions. Okay. Yeah, I've discussed, uh, discussed this because it's quite central for our understanding of who we are. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. okay. Well, Don't worry, you'll get it. You, you'll get it by the time we finish here. I'm sure you will. Uh, the banking families own the world. It's simple as that. If you don't believe that, then you also haven't done your homework. So all the discussions we've been having, and I've been going into many of these discussions, money keeps coming up all the time. But remember, money doesn't exist. Money is just empty promises. It, there is no thing as money. In fact, for those of you that know, I've been... I've been actively involved in legal cases in South Africa against the banks, not just the banks, against the Central Bank, the South African Reserve Bank, the Minister of Finance as well. I've even opened up a constitutional court case against the banks, the Minister of Finance and the Reserve Bank, uh, which had an interesting ending. If we have time, we can talk about that, but uh, it doesn't stop. Uh, two years ago, myself and a small group of other people, mostly Scott Cundall, started uh, asking the banks certain questions. And, um, and we couldn't get answers out of them. And then we started doing research and realizing how it all works. And for the fractional reserve system, you all know that, or you should know that. And the fact that money doesn't exist. In fact, in the South African Bank Act, to my horror of horrors, and I was in court, and I was doing research to stand up and defend myself, because the only way we can do this is to, when you stand up in court and defend yourself. So we didn't use lawyers. I went there and I stood and defended myself against the, the most you know, highest paid lawyers money can buy. And not just one of them, I was alone in the court against the judge that you have to call my lord and bow down when you walk into the court, my lord. And you start realizing the cabal, ritualistic club that these people belong to. It's spectacular. They wear black robes. And you go there, go there and call it my lord, my lord. I, you know, I thought I was going to cause trouble at first, but then I bit my tongue and I didn't do that. <laughs> and... And, but what I found is that in the Bank Act in South Africa, and I'm sure the same goes for, for the rest of the world, there is no definition for the world money. There is, however, a definition for bills of exchange, promissory notes, and negotiable instruments. And I realized the banks don't work with money. The banks work with promissory notes, bills of exchange, and negotiable instrument. And, and those are called liquid because they have value. They are the liquid, ne valuable instruments, negotiable instruments, that banks work with behind the scenes. And this becomes really exciting and interesting. So we started realizing we could create promissory notes and bills of exchange and liquid negotiable instruments as soon as they have our signature on it. And we started doing some of this, just causing trouble. Anyway, it didn't get us very far because the judges didn't understand this at all. They thought we were, we were just causing trouble with the courts. But nevertheless, what we managed to do in the three Supreme Court cases that I defended myself against these banksters, we managed to get very important things out of the lawyers or the bankers. They admitted to everything we accused them of. We accused them of breaking the, bank, the, the contract law because they don't have what they pretend to loan. They don't have the money. Remember, in contract law, you, need, you can't lend something that you do not possess. So when, that was one of our arguments. So we said, well, the banks aren't actually banks because they don't own any money. And they admitted, yes, no, we don't own any money. I said, okay, great. <laughs> Judge, did you get that? And, um, and then we said, well, that means that you're an agent and you're not a banker, so you can't charge interest and you can't come after me because the contract is null and void. And then we realized that they securitize your signature. They sell every document you have, every document you sign with your signature on it and has a value on it is sold into, in a process called securitization. And uh, this is a global industry. Global banking industry works with securitization. And they're very proud of it. They publish the securitization information on their websites. But then when you argue securitization in court, they deny it. They say, no, we don't know what you're talking about. No. And the judges don't go and do their homework because the judges are so blinded by the banks and the lawyers, they just follow. They just can't imagine that the banks could be lying. So... 
they, they agree that they practice securitization, or first of all, they, they, they denied that, that there is anything called securitization. They accused us of being fanciful and, and making things up, and um, that they didn't have money to lend. We accuse them of not having locus standi or any rights to start the action against you because they sell your documents and your contract to a third party called a special purpose vehicle. And that special purpose vehicle company is a third party that takes complete ownership of your property, your car, your credit card debt, your overdraft. Everything is securitized by the banks because they don't have money. That's how they make money for themselves. It's all shuffling paper and bookkeeping entries and selling empty promises. And this is how junk bonds are created. Because once you haven't paid on your bond, three months after you haven't paid on your home loan, your bond, uh, that goes stale. The, what this, the, secure, the SPV uh, does, they then claim insurance on it, and they, they file it. So the SPV gets paid. The bank has been paid the moment they sell your signature to them. Everyone's been paid, but you keep paying for your home loan for the next 30 years. The moment you stop paying, the bank comes after you, says you owe us money. There's a contract, my lord. See, he signed a contract, he owes us money. And the judge doesn't for one second say, well, hold on, let's look at the validity of this contract. Do you have rights to this contract? Who owns the property? So this has now been exposed. We are this close in South Africa. Myself and Scott Cundell from New Economics Rights Alliance, we are this close from bringing down the banks. Yes. This close. Yes. So, Because they're just lying thieves. What you're, talking, what you're talking about, the global banking industry, people, is nothing more than the largest legalized organized crime syndicate. That's what it is. So they're a bunch of criminals. We've got to do something about it to stop it. So I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got two cases against the banks now. One of five counts of fraud. Uh, which they don't they haven't argued any of the points. They've argued why I'm why I'm claiming all the money <laughs> that I'm claiming. They're not arguing any of the points. And Scott Kundal has got a case with New Economics Rights Alliance, which has become the third largest nonprofit organization in South Africa in the last six months, about 160,000 members. Um, he's he's launched a case of of unconstitutionality against all the banks. We're about to launch criminal charges against the banks full-blown criminal charges, because the evidence is just becoming overwhelming. And all it's going to take now, one judgment. If there are any mathematicians here, you can see the complete insaneness of this. Out of thousands and thousands and thousands of court cases, people against banks, not one person has ever won a case against the banks. Just think about that. Clearly, this is stacked in favor of the banks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Clearly. And the judges are either paid off or they're too stupid to understand what's going on. But things have changed. We have a few situations in South Africa. We've had small victories where the banks withdrew. This is how clever they are. They withdraw before they get a judgment or they abandon. So there isn't a precedent on the record. So you can't then go and argue the precedent. So they're very clever with this. But we're going to force them into a judgment because of what we're doing. And... Um, it's just going to take that first judgment, and then it's all over. The entire global banking system works on the same principles, and it's just going to be a domino effect. And we'll do what Iceland did, hopefully, just reverse all the mortgage loans, reverse all the car loans, credit card, just, you know, just reverse everything, because these thugs have stolen trillions from us and make us their slaves. And that's exactly what they do. And this is linked to our education system, because most people are indoctrinated into this way of thinking since childhood. Um, this is, our education system has nothing to do with learning. It's, it's really developed and funded by the banking families um, to condition humanity into following orders and respecting authority. They control the contents of all the textbooks and, and uh, transfer of information. Our schools are really just indoctrination camps to brainwash our children to follow orders and to bow to authority. It's got nothing to do with learning, people. The money, con money controls the legal system, as I mentioned already. And uh, if you just look on the internet on a daily basis, you'll see that the economic collapse is just imminent. It's somehow being uh, kept alive. The question is, and this is what I need to end on, because we can't keep talking about doom and gloom all the time. We need to talk about what are we going to do as a species? What are we going to do when it all collapses? And this is where the most exciting thing happens. And this is my message to everyone in the world. This is where the true humanity shines, 
and we realize how beautifully we can survive without money. We have to find a new system because this system is broken. It doesn't work. Um, we cannot continue doing what we've been doing for the past 6,000 years. That is insanity. And as you know, insanity is defined as doing something over and over again and expecting different results. So hopefully after 6,000 years, we now have learned. Don't try and fix the current system. Change it completely. What is the one thing that we can do to change it? You know what that is. And this is where the Ubuntu Liberation Movement comes in. <laughs> Join the movement. Realize it's a movement about higher consciousness. It's about... It's about breaking all the norms that we've been conditioned to believe, standing up to authority, and taking back what belongs to us, living, breathing human beings. The Ubuntu Contribution System, I called it Contributionism in 2005 when I first started writing about it, completely new social structure, abundance for all. It's based on ancient knowledge when they didn't have money, where everyone contributes their natural talents or acquired skills for the greatest benefit of all in the community. It's a simple system. It comes with a lot of questions because we're so poisoned by capitalism, con consumerism. It raises many questions instantly, but I've been through this thousands and thousands of times. I can already think what, tell you what you're thinking, and I'm going to tell you what you're thinking just now. It goes back to the African roots called Ubuntu. All ancient cultures, in a way, shared this African system called Ubuntu. They have different names for it, but it always comes down to the same thing. It's amazing that the ancient cultures survived for thousands of years not using money, and they thrived, as Foster Gamble would say. And they had a similar philosophy. If it's not good for everyone, it's no good at all. And that is a beautiful philosophy that I'd like to share with everybody, because I don't want to do anybody harm, and I don't want to do anything that's going to harm anyone because it does me good. I'm not interested in doing that. And this is why the whole Ubuntu contributionism system, the Ubuntu movement, is a movement of higher consciousness. It is for people moving into a new age, a new era of higher consciousness. Exactly that. So that's the virus we want to inject into the South African parliament. Higher consciousness. Not because I want to run for president. In fact, if by some miracle I became president, and this was a question that was asked me in Durban last weekend at our first public meeting, so what's going to do? If, what are you going to do if you become president? I said, well, the first thing I'll do is I'll dissolve the government. Just dissolve the whole government. Just, just, just dismantle it. And give the power to the people, wherever they are, to start their own local communities. Rewrite the laws. The laws we have are not written for the people. They're written for the corporations. Our inalienable, inalienable rights. This is what I need to remind people of. And this is... <clears throat> Beautiful, because this is part of the ANC's Freedom Charter that they stood for for over 100 years. Now, it's been very conveniently forgotten. And this has become the, the new Freedom Charter for the Ubuntu movement. The country belongs to the people. The land belongs to its people. The water, the minerals, the air, the air waves doesn't belong to Vodafone. It belongs to the people. The forests and everything in the country belongs to the people. <laughs> yeah, the, the land in China belongs to the people and they should do exactly the same this applies to every country people it does not belong to the government or any large corporation that has laid claim to it and when you read this statement you realize that we've appointed our leaders to be our servants but they're not serving us we appointed them to do the best for us not for them so whatever we want and we need as a people they should be doing for us is that happening? no, the opposite is happening so what has happened here? The government is not serving the people. The only conclusion we can reach is that they're serving themselves and the corporation that fund them. They've turned the people into their slaves. The government and large corporations have stolen the country from its people. It's as simple as that. We've become the slaves, and unless we do something about it, it stops. How do we know this? In South Africa, I don't know about... These countries, I believe uh, the European countries, how it works now, I haven't done that research because I'm focusing there. The government of South Africa and the Republic of South Africa are both registered as two separate corporations on the U.S. Securities Exchange. So they're corporations that trade us as commodities. Every week new laws are passed in every country, I guess, in South Africa. It's published in the Government Gazette. Nobody knows where to get it how to read it, what it means, but they publish in the Government Gazette and they get away with it. You see, it was published. You didn't object, so now it's a new law. 
That's how they get away with it. But every week they publish new laws that we don't understand and we don't want. Our laws protect the corporations. They do not serve the people. Corporations have more rights than living, breathing human beings. I've witnessed this in my own presence in court on three occasions. And the fund gets better every day. Because, you know, um, for those of you that have been following some of what I've been doing, uh, two weeks ago, our legal advisor, Raymond Dix, was attacked in his house by ten armed men, uh, tied up and held at gunpoint for three and a half hours while they ransacked his office, his home office. They made it look like a, a robbery, but uh, when they left and very carefully removed his computer, his hard drive, his backup hard drive, and his secondary hidden backup hard drive, which they knew exactly where it was, they left with only two other things. The legal files pertaining to my actions against the courts, the, the banks, and Scott Kundal's files, the New Economics Rights Alliance, the Ubuntu movement, my movement, and New Economics Rights Alliance. Those are the only files, legal files that disappeared. So it's very clear what's going on here. The banks hit us where it hurts most, that our nerve center removed all our research, documentation, and files, but we had backups elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> So, so now it's obvious, you know, if they take me out, they just created another martyr. So bring it on. <laughs> I, I don't care. I know where I'm going. I'm going to sit on the right-hand side of Jesus. <laughs> we need a whole new legal system written for the people, by the people not by the corporations and the governments that want to schnei the people into the ground. Everything in South Africa and in other countries belongs to the people. ESCOM, for example, is the electricity supply giant that supplies most of Africa with electricity. All the installations of ESCOM belong to the people. The coal they use that they get out of the ground to charge us for the electricity belongs to the people because the coal belongs to the people. Sasol is the, the coal to, to liquid a petroleum company that was paid for by the taxpayer. The technology was developed from German technology in the 1920s. That was paid for by the South African taxpayer, all the early installations for Sasol. So all the fuel that we should be driving on in South Africa, we should have virtually for free because all the components belong to the people. The railways run every day, but they don't transport people. They transport coal and wood, everything for the corporations, nothing for the people. You can't catch a train anywhere in South Africa. And so it goes. The forestry, the minerals. Forestry between Sapi and Mondi in South Africa, they own more than a million hectares of land that they somehow managed to take possession of. Who gave it to them? The people didn't agree to give it to them, but it belongs to them. So you can see how this theft of the land and the, the, all the inalienable rights of the people of the land have been stolen and given to corporations. So the government and the large corporations have stolen the country from its people. It's obvious. What do the people need? This is where we start seeing the beautiful side and how simple things can be. What do we need? We need food, water, love, friendship, homes, tables, chairs, knives, forks, gardens, clothes, technology, healthcare, arts and culture. We need everything that each and every one of you can imagine and beyond. We need everything and we should have all of it because there should be no hurdles to achieving this and having that, right? We do not need money. Did you see money anywhere in that list? No, we don't need money. Money gets in the way. Money is the obstacle. It's the hurdle to all progress. Money does nothing. People do everything. People plow the lands, grow the food, build the bridges, build the rockets, solve the mathematical equations, create the technology. People do everything. Money does nothing. Money is just the obstacle to all this incredible progress. People create the arts and the culture. Money does nothing. The origins of money goes back to Sumeria once again. These Sumerians, the first forms of money were really little clay tablets. They were tokens of exchange. And then eventually they started minting them, as you know. So for millennia, great minds have stood up against the abuse of humanity through money. It's not something new. Julius Caesar stood up against the money, the the. the the powers of money. It took back from the money changes the power to coin money and minted coins on benefit of all. With this new plentiful supply of money, he established many massive construction projects and built great public works. And we all know what happened to Julius Caesar. <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas in 1225 
said that the charging of interest is wrong because it applies to double charging, charging for both the money and the use of money. In fact, church law in the Middle Ages forbade the charging of interest on loans and even made it a crime called usury, which we know very well today. And even Jesus in his last year of life, probably the only physical force he ever applied, was threw out the money changers out of the temple because they were abusing the people. And this is by far the most cutting statement made in recent times, Thomas Jefferson, because this is what we find ourselves in today. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties and standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks, remember all our banks in the world, are virtu virtually all the banks are private banks, private corporations, whose interest is making profit at all cost. So if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around the, the banks will drive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. That's where we are standing today. All over the world, this is the situation we're in. Money is the obstacle to all progress. It does nothing for society. It is the absolute tool of control by those that control the issue and the printing of money. That's why when I say they own the world, they do. They literally, physically own the world and each of one of our asses. It prevents the natural flow of free energy. And that is very important to this weekend's activities here. Money prevents the natural flow of free energy. So I beg you, everyone present here, Remember, it's about free energy, not I'm going to make a billion dollars out of this energy. Give it away for free. It'll come back to you in ways you cannot imagine. Do that one thing for humanity. If you find any source of free energy, don't try and make zillions out of it. It will kill you or they will kill you before you can get it out there. Money is the primary cause for the seven deadly sins. We all know the seven deadly sins, or have we forgotten them already? It's not the love of money. Many people ask, oh, it's just the love of money. Money is nothing wrong with money, man. It's just a form of exchange. You know, we're so poisoned that we, we, try, and, we try and argue for, for it. We try and defend it. That's how poisoned our minds have become. It's incredible. It's not the love of money. It's the mere presence of money that causes all these problems. If you take money out of the system, all this stuff suddenly and miraculously vanishes. So what is the solution? If it's the mere presence of money or the love of money of all of the above, what are we going to do to solve the problem? The answer is so blatantly obvious. Remove money. Just get rid of it. Get rid of it. What do we need it for? It's causing all the strife in our lives. It's destroying our planet. The minds are raping our mother earth, taking out the precious guts out of our Gaia and distributing it around the world to People that claim they own it, it's sick. The obvious questions, if you remove money, so who's going to shovel the crap? How are we going to pay for things? I'll just sit on my ass and do nothing. I want 50 Ferraris. <laughs> you know, are we going back to the dark ages, living in caves? Is this a lawless society? Who's going to make the rules? Why should I do something I don't want? These are the first things. I know these are the most commonly asked questions, and I'm sure that you're asking some of them to yourselves. But um, I can tell you that as you work through this process of a moneyless society, a Ubuntu society where everybody contributes their natural talents or acquired skills to the greatest benefit of all with certain minor rules that are not rules. It's really just an agreement that this is how we're going to work together. The moment you start working in that kind of community, the abundance is so spectacular that we right now cannot imagine it. It is not possible for us to imagine it until you start immersing yourself in this kind of thinking. And I call these the Ubuntu communities, as I said, where everyone contributes their natural talents or acquired skills for the greater benefit of all in the community. A new social structure for a new world and a new age. Abundance for all beyond our wildest belief. There are five mantras, five key points to the Ubuntu society. And it's not barter or trade. Everybody often jumps, a lot of people jumps to the, to the conclusion, think, oh, let's go back to barter. No. He who has more to barter or trade will eventually rule the roost. So you can't go to that system. If you have nothing to trade, what are you going to say? Well, I've got nothing to trade, so I'll have to, you know, kiss your butt. No. 
So the Ubuntu contribution mantra is the five points. No money, no barter, no trade, no value attached to anything greater or lesser than anything else. Because why? Each one of our contributions should be and is equally valuable. If you start telling, well, I'm a doctor, my time is more valuable than yours, you're barking up the wrong tree, brother. Okay. So, and the final one where everyone contributes for the greater benefit of all in the community because that is how you get rewarded. You get rewarded by the recognition of the people in your community. Isn't that the highest reward everybody wants and is trying to buy with money is recognition and respect of others? In essence, ultimately, that's what most people really want, is just to be loved and recognized for what they've done. And they think they can use money to do that. And then when they make a lot, a lot of money, they get zillions in the bank, then they suddenly realize, oh, well, nobody loves me anymore. They all want to take my money. So let me spend my money, and then people will love me. And that's generally what happens when they start paying for things, and people love them more, when they start giving it away. <laughs> so united Ubuntu communities. In unity, we thrive, and anything is possible. Anything is possible. A world without money. There's no crime, no envy, no gluttony, no greed, no hoarding, no hierarchy. And the whole Ubuntu, the Ubuntu movement and the Ubuntu party has no hierarchy. Communities look after themselves. We have no central government. We don't have any central assholes trying to tell you how you should be running your life. No obstacles to any kind of progress. Because the solutions are simple and there are many bright minds here. We all know what the solutions are, what should be done to solve the problems, and somehow our politicians just can't get it right. They just they keep screwing it up, you know? So don't ask the politicians to solve it. Give it to the scientists, give it to the farmers, give it to the engineers. They'll solve the problems for us. Ordinary people will. Politicians will do nothing. Transition will have to occur in simple steps that flow from one to the other. We can't go from zero to hero. We can't go from a moneyless-driven, capitalistic, consumeristic monster to a moneyless society that lives in harmony and zen, right? It's not going to happen. So uh, if you go onto my website, the ubuntuparty.org.za website, I've started posting a number of papers on how the transition will take place. There's not time for it now, so I ask you, please go onto our website and check it out. It's beautiful. What's key here is that the small towns will probably play a very important part in the transformation, because in small towns and small communities, people will agree on things a lot quicker than in the big cities, right? So they will agree, okay, we need to get off the grid, we need to grow enough food for all of us, we need to make sure we got water, and they can go out and do it. We must create alternative energy for ourselves in our town, so if the grid goes down, we stay alive. And the small towns and villages will become the activators of this transitional phase. And I put together a few theories and ideas to give people ideas how to start doing this. It also goes into, into our education and schooling systems, where we stop, stop sending your children to school. Please, I beg you, don't send your children to school. Don't do it. You're turning them into monsters. I've had in our few, few of my friends in Johannesburg in South Africa that have not sent their kids to school. They are much smarter than the kids that go to school. And I'm not kidding you. They really are. They just learn from their parents, and they learn... and. And you'll find that, that what, often what happens with these kids, they start reading later. They might start reading a little bit later. But when they start reading, they become like these, they become like these monster little readers. They just read everything. I mean, these little kids are reading books that you know, other kids don't even dream of. And that's because they're not preconditioned by the schooling system. <coughs> Energy, water, food, housing, arts and recreation. These are the things that small communities can take control of very, very quickly and establish it for themselves, make themselves go off the grid and be totally in control of their own destiny. And many, many community projects must be and should be attached to this activity. Absolute abundance on all levels. Once you start doing this, food, science, culture, community, abundance on all levels. Now, I'm going to give you a small example. You've got to use your imagination here because there's not enough time now and we've got to finish off here. So... Imagine in the little town that I live, we've got a river, we've got a fish farm, we've got a dairy farm, we've got a bakery, we've got a wood, fa wood, wood factory, a metal factory. The community starts to work in these projects. The, the whole Ubuntu thing means that, and contribution means that everybody must contribute three hours a week towards one of these community projects. That's all you have to do, three hours a week. A little town of 1,000 people, it's 3,000 hours a week. No municipality or town council can afford three hours, 3,000 hours a week salaries 
for people to do this work. Can you see how that's dramatically shifted the status quo and the equilibrium? How much we can produce if we just work for three hours a week on basic projects, producing milk, cheese, butter, fish, breeding fish, uh, baking bread, planting, growing vegetables, and so forth. So now the community has been doing this for six months or a year, and they've established abundance on all levels, where all the people in that community that participate, that's why I called it contributionism, that participate and add their t talent and their skills and their time, get everything, not for free, but virtually for free, so cheaply that the rest of the stuff, and also there's a principle where you, man, where, you, where you create three times as much as you need for your own community. And I structure everything in the, in the Ubuntu uh, philosophy on the sacred geometry principles, 3366. So you produce three times as much as you need for your community. Why? Because there'll be other communities that can't produce what you're doing, so you'll be actually helping them while they're helping you with the things that you can't produce. So, and by the end of that, there's so much abundance because you're doing it three times that Whatever you don't consume in your own little village or town, what are you going to do with? You're going to make it available on farmers markets and stores in your town for the surrounding communities. The moment you've achieved that state, you've created the domino effect. Because what's going to happen to all the neighboring towns? All the people from those towns are going to come buy your bread, your milk, your cheese, your whatever it is you produce. Because it's going to be a fraction of the cost they pay for it in their own town. There's your domino effect. There's your trigger point. So. Think about it from that perspective. At the, at the outset, it sounds like a huge thing. Wow, how are we going to go from there to a moneyless society? I believe that I've just taken you through a very simplistic examples, example of how small towns and small villages and communities can be the trigger points and the examples that start the domino effect. Once the first town is set up, it's impossible for the surrounding towns to stay alive. They will have to follow the same example. Otherwise, all their businesses will close down. And when they do close down, then they will follow your example. So either they will do it willingly or they'll be forced into it because of stupidity. In, in the Ubuntu communities, children follow their passion and their dreams. The education system changes completely. There are no classrooms. Children learn real practical skills. So by the age of 16, they've done everything. They've baked the bread. They've, they've worked in nuclear laboratories. They've built rockets, they've built homes, they've created they've create earth, built earth ships, they've planted seedlings and grown fruit, and they'll be so wise by the time you're 16 because you've had all this experience. You'll be smarter than all the professors in the world thrown together today. <laughs> so, and, take, take any school lever today. Put them on a farm. Put them anywhere into a practical solution. What can a person with a high school diploma do today? Absolutely nothing. We're useless to society. That's what they've created. Can you see the brilliance in their plan? They are so smart, these people. They. <laughs> That's us, right? <laughs> so we are so smart that we're doing this to ourselves, right? Where we create our children, turn our children into these little... We lock them up in jails for 12 years, most precious years of their life, and then throw them out to start all over again and, and be totally open to manipulation and control. So master teachers, only when a community decides that you're a master shoemaker or you're a master rocket scientist or you're a master baker or a master that only the community can decide who they will allow to teach their children. Isn't that a better system? Then teachers that go and get some diploma and they're real assholes and they teach your child. You go, God, how can that? I'm not going to let that teacher teach my child. The community will have the final say. So when I say decentralized government, that's how fine it becomes. The community chooses who their master teachers are, the people that they have respect for and the people that they honor for their capacity and their ability. And this is how we grow, how we build Ubuntu communities, because only out of unity comes infinite diversity and abundance. Only out of unity. Anything else is a futile exercise that will bring us back to the same point at some future point in time. So I'm going to end here, because this is the end. Join the Ubuntu Liberation Movement. It's not just a South African entity. We've had various people around the world say to us, can we start the same thing in, in wherever? Yes. Go online. Start the same thing. Use all the material I've published. Put it out there. Share it with everybody. 
and become part of this transitional phase. And uh, thank you for listening. I hope I gave you some food for thought. Please, please wait one moment. People are coming up to me and asking me, what can we do after the conference? Now, one of the things we can do after the conference, Michael needs exposure, <laughs> big time. We need a bus going around. Euro, Everybody who is, uh, has a Facebook page, a Twitter page, you just put one line. Michael Tellinger for president, <laughs> and, and, and this website. People are going to pick it up sooner or later on the internet, and it's going to be recycled, 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 recycled. It's safer. We're going to get the word out, and the ball is going to roll. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>